Great. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dennis Mitchell, Vice Provost for Faculty Advancement, and I'm excited to welcome you to today's panel, How to Lose Your Fear of Academic Twitter. Um, this topic is a new one for us and our portfolio, but uh, with COVID-19 and the pandemic at hand, the shift to remote work for everyone, um, the faculty need all of the tools at their disposal to bring their work to a broader audience. Um, during today's session, you will learn from overall best practices when it comes to getting started at this, sharing content and building your following. You'll also learn some basic do's and don'ts to the platforms and uh, we'll close with a question and answer uh, session uh, for the panelists from you. Uh, I must admit that I'm pretty much a dinosaur at this. Uh, so when it comes to technology in, in any way, really, uh, I do the best that I can, but I fuddle more than anything else. So if you're feeling a little bit nervous about venturing into this world of Twitter at all, um, you're in good company, or at least you're in my company. Uh, so I, I wish you well. We're really lucky to uh, have four experts on hand to have this conversation. Um, three faculty, uh, faculty Twitter super users with a combined uh, 20,000 followers. Uh, Seamus Khan, professor of sociology. Susan Lynch, professor of medicine. And Michelle Young, adjunct assistant professor of architecture, planning, and preservation. In addition, It is also a ple oh, why am I losing all of this? Well, we don't actually need this. So since uh, this is not working, as I told you, I, I, I uh, fuddle around. Um, in addition, it's my pleasure to introduce Acacia O'Connor. And okay, Acacia is Columbia's director of social media and has been a real friend to our office uh, for many years now. So it's, it's a pleasure. Uh, she reaches by herself 375,000 followers. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Acacia and turn the session over to her. Thank you so much. I'm going to do a screen share. Um, and I, I first and foremost wanna thank so much the Office of Faculty Advancement, um, such an amazing group of folks, and Jen Leach in particular, major kudos for getting this all together and organizing it and uh, making sure I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and thank you always, Dennis, for all the work that you do. Um, it's great to work with y'all. I'm going to share my screen and I have a little bit of, um, I have this little PowerPointy thing here. Let me go back to the beginning. Um, so again, uh, we're going to have three segments to this day. Um, one is I'm going to do as brief as possible overview, so I talk as little as possible, uh, get that out of the way. And then we're going to talk to our, our, our folks, our faculty panelists, who each have a really great diverse experience with this platform and others. Um, and also want to say Dennis is great at LinkedIn. Uh, I know that that is not the focus of today's talk, but I, I think he's underselling uh, his, his work in social. Um, and then we'll have time to answer your questions. So um, again, uh, I hate the, the uh, label expert. I think that there are so many things to learn and things are moving so quickly in this sphere that there's like never the perfect answer to any of these um but hopefully some of these tips are helpful to you um so yeah you've already heard and had an introduction of our three panelists um and here are their twitter bios a whole a whole dissertation upon itself could be written about the twitter bio and how to best do that um, these are their examples, and I think mine is in here as well. Um, again, shout out Jen, who, who built this wonderful PowerPoint. Um, super proud to have Dr. Lunch here. Dr. Lunch was in a previous workshop that I did for the Herbert Irving uh, Cancer Center at CUIMC, where we talked about, like, again, previously losing your fear of Twitter and now a powerhouse tweeter. So. <laughs> Great success story. I think you were you were good to begin with. I only gave you a little bit of a nudge in the right direction. Seamus with with perhaps the best uh, current 
icon photo of us all. Um, so then there's me. Uh, and uh, let's just get to the get, getting started now that you've, you've seen it all uh, from us as far as this platform is concerned. Um, so I'm, I don't, let's see if I can, can I see you guys? Because I'm like kind of interested in knowing, I don't think I can both share my screen and see you, but maybe we'll do a share of hands later. Um, presuming that among the people who are here, such a huge number of you, truly, um, that there's a wide range of experience as to who has a Twitter, who's like already really on it, who has never used it before. Maybe you're like a literal infant with it and you're just no, or you're you're there, you have an account, you barely use it, you never post, you're just lurking, you're, you're maybe you're a serial retweeter, nothing original. Um, we got you. Um, I think that, again, like I said, there's no wrong answers, but there are some best practices and paths that you can follow. And I think the most important thing I can say for people who are, you know, to use the, jar the jargon is, cultivating your personal brand. Um, there's no wrong way because it's you and it's personal to you. Um, that said, uh, there are some basic things. And especially if you're in this world and many of you are experts in your fields or you're experts of something or you're really interested in a few different things, um, it can be sort of a, a overwhelming experience because Twitter is in itself its own internet. You're like in a whole world where everyone is there. It's like a chat room and everyone is present. Um, so something that I like to do is go find someone I really admire. Maybe it's like someone in your field or even just a friend, a fellow faculty member uh, or your institution, your, uh, your center. I mean, at Columbia here, most faculties or um, departments may have their own Twitter or under the Twitter of the school. Um, and look who follows them, uh, see what they post, find again some super users, people who like post the type of thing that you might want to post, um, or at least like that you're drawn to. It's like real life. You want to follow and engage with the people that you're attracted to, <laughs> like truly as friends, as colleagues, the people who you vibe with. Um, basics of using hashtags. Uh, there's a lot I could say on this, but try to do as few as possible and use them only uh, when you're contributing to an ongoing conversation. We can talk about that a little bit more in depth if people want, um, but I'm just going to keep moving forward um, with a side note that it is important to always include images with what you're, you're posting because um, I'll caveat that because there are a lot of things you do post that are just your, your feelings or your thoughts or your observations on something. Um, maybe you're posting a link and that has an automatic, an automatic image that comes with it sometimes. Um, but in general, your posts are going to do better algorithmically if there is an image attached to them, uh, especially if it's an image of a person. Um, even in Twitter, this is especially, especially true in, uh, link, in um, Instagram, but in Twitter as well, if it has a picture of your face, Michelle will uh, attest to the photos of uh, her child that do so well, uh, just photos of, of human beings um, or just real stuff that's going on uh, do tend to do better. Um, wait. Yes. Uh, here are some like just guidelines to what to post. Um, I'm just gonna go right through this, but I wanna also focus on one thing. Um, which is the first thing, keep the mood positive. I think <laughs> I looked back through my own and I was very sad to see that I, I was not following this guideline in the recent weeks, which I think is understandable. And I'm going to cut myself some slack on that. But I think it, it, it we talk about four major like moods that activate people to share content online. Um, one is anger, one is sadness, uh, one is like a, what I would call like a wow mood. And then one is happiness. Um, in general, I try to advise people to do in Twitter as you would 
in life, which is keep, keep it positive because that's what people will want to gravitate towards. And also as many of you probably know from engaging with social media and the internet, um, it can really tend towards the not positive and people will appreciate what you have to say more if it comes from um, a balanced, not an always critical viewpoint. Um, but it's difficult, like I said, so just keep, keep an awareness of that. It's mindful, Twitter mindfulness. Um, I, I'm going to go quickly through all of these, but we can also share this PowerPoint after the fact. Um, but one of my biggest tips for this is sort of what I said at the top, which is share who you are, like all the different elements of you, what you read online, uh, and what you think about it, or just a quote from it is something that I like to do because I don't always have an opinion about something that I've read or have a response to something I've read. It's just interesting. Um, share what you read offline. Take a picture of, of a book or paper that you're reading or, um, you know, shout out the person who wrote it. Um, share what you're working on. Share what you're, you know, shop around your syllabus that you're working on and ask people for help. Um, Twitter is a soapbox, but it's also a community of people who um, are there for you and for one another when, you know, you need some feedback. Um, and it's like being in a conference, but all the time at any hour around the world. Um, we'll talk about audience building when we talk to our, our panelists. Um, do you want to just stick on these? important negative don'ts. Um, from the university perspective, we don't have a lot of like, don't do this, do do this. We are a free speech university and we all respect everyone's right to use social media to uh, you know, voice their opinions. That is your constitutionally protected right. Um, with some caveats, certainly. Um, but, you know, like I said, keep it positive and be mindful that Twitter can be a place where anyone can see anything. Even if your account is private, someone might see something you wrote, screenshot it, share it with someone else. And you just don't want to be in a position where you're hurting people's feelings with a hot opinion that you had that you just felt like you had to share or a complaint that you, a gripe that you had. If there's another way to remedy a complaint that isn't social media, I would advise anyone at any time in any situation to go do those first and then use social media as a last resort, perhaps, um, mostly with airlines and other, <laughs> other customer service entities and not with your students or administration. Um, and again, we'll, we'll talk about this some more because it is, it is a big question when it comes to Twitter, how to balance your personal opinions and your political opinions with furthering your scholarship, your professional career, and, and yourself as, as a person. Um, oh, I have some compelling tweets, so maybe this is a good way to introduce our panelists now. Um, this is, this has got everything, right? Seamus, um, feel free to chime in here now, but uh, this is, I think that Seamus really does something that I admire for in Twitter users, which is he brings his whole self to Twitter, but he also is all about his business. He's all about teaching, about pedagogy, about the community of scholarship, um, and about advancing other people and lifting them up as colleagues. Um, this is a, a way to engage with his work and it, it's making other people's engagement with it easier. Um, so we'll just go through and this will be a good way for me to ask you if you could speak really quickly to if you can remember uh, what it was like when you first got on Twitter famous and what it's like now, uh, especially since I think you've gone viral a couple of times recently. Um, and you've created whole like whole entities from tweets. Yeah, um, so I don't really remember what it was first like when I went on Twitter. I mean, I think, um, as you noted, like the, 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 there's sort of, I would say like two things I think about 
with Twitter. The first is, and this is kind of a constant refrain for me that I try and embed my professional life in my life rather than my life in my professional life. And so I do try to kind of bring my whole self to, to Twitter. Um, um, and um, I use it a lot for getting information out about like papers that I have coming out, or in this case, a book where Jennifer, who's also on Twitter a lot and teaches up in um, uh, public health and SMS, and I had produced all of this material to go alongside our book where, um, you know, it often feels like a lot of what we do goes into a void. And so I try and use Twitter to sort of clearly and, and quickly make people aware of things that I've done. Um, and I think, you know, it's super self-serving, but I would say my orientation is also to make sure that like, like the aim of this tweet is to be useful for people who might want to be teaching our book. Like there's all this stuff you could use, including, you know, flipping your classroom with lectures that I've produced. And so in the end, it kind of helps them. And I, I would say that the kind of aha moment for me for Twitter was realizing that it's not a monologue. So if you just treat it as a way for you to say things that are important to you, um, it'll be the same as like hanging out with someone who never asks you a question about them, which is to say immensely unpleasant and people won't pay much attention to you. So if you take the basic social lesson of like what it is to be a community member, which is where you ask questions of other people, you lift them up and periodically you bring things of yourself to the conversation, I think that's sort of where my strategy lies and what I, what I think has been relatively successful for me. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. We'll come back to that. It's not a monologue. Um, I think that's a great, a great note to come away with this, come away from this with. Um, let's see. Uh, this is this is I think both Jen and I when we were lurking through Michelle's tweets yesterday. Uh, we're like, this is if I were to play it, it's a video that Michelle took of a rooftop, presumably near your house. Maybe you could t give us the background on this, but uh, I think this is like a almost a meme now who says NYC is dead, but it's just like a moment. It immerses you, it's a short thing. You're seeing something, you're sharing it with some other people. Um, and it's just those things that occur to you that if there was someone standing next to you, um, you would be like, hey, isn't this cool? Like or like someone's downstairs and you're like, hey, come up and see what's going on on the roof. Um, so one thing that Michelle, I would like you to speak to a little bit is um, again, how to make it feel, uh, how to make it feel comfortable to share something like this, share a picture of your family, and then also share stuff about untapped cities or your class that you're working on um, or virtual teaching, like how to mix it all up. Um. Sure. Uh, so yeah, quickly on this video, I took this in the height of the conversation of is New York City dead? New York City's not dead, it is dead. That whole debate that raged in August in New York City. Um, and I wasn't really planning to create content around it, but this happened outside my window. Uh, this is a garage across the street and a dance class from a studio nearby came on. Um, and if you play the video, if you go to the, the tweet, um, it's just this like burst of happiness, I think that was happening in a time um, of some somewhat negativity in New York. Um, and uh, and it, it also fit into like the conversation. So I had that pinned because it uh, reflects kind of the positivity I want to share about New York City. But going back to Twitter itself, um, I actually just looked up when I created my Twitter account. So July or something 2010, but I originally used social media Twitter from a business perspective. So the at untapped New York at untapped NY has been around a year longer and has been active for far longer than my personal account. And that's easy. We produce content, we put it out there. We're kind of just broadcasting, retweeting other people talking about our stuff and engaging when people are reaching out to us. Um, and I, I had trouble kind of figuring out what, what I was supposed to do with my personal account. So I had claimed it early, but didn't really do much. Um, and for a while I, I did spend some time 
following new people that were in my sphere. So people that had architecture, urbanism, urban planning in their uh, profile accounts. And there used to be tools that could just kind of do this for you automatically, follow and follow, but now you're not really supposed to do that. Twitter like kind of will shut down various APIs or your account. So don't recommend doing that, but that's kind of how I built some of the early followers. And you can still do that manually, of course, find other people's lists, look for who they're following, follow them, et cetera. Um, but I would say it wasn't until the beginning of this pandemic that I kind of started to really have fun with Twitter. Um, I guess maybe I had a little more time. Uh, there was a lot of stuff I just was documenting in my house, things that were happening. Um, and I, 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 made, I came to a realization that um, people actually wanted to know who I was personally. I never really thought that was that interesting to people, but um, because I have a brand, uh, anytime I posted something about myself personally, it would be the most popular. And I was like, weird, why does anyone really wanna know anything about me? Um, but it was true. So like uh, Akashia mentioned, I have photos of like my daughter doing silly things. I have photos of myself. Uh, I can't cook. So there's a picture of me trying to boil water, but the, uh, I've turned on the wrong, uh, uh, whatever thing on the stove. I don't even know the words for cooking. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, things like that uh, seem to do the best, but then also from a professional perspective, um, I just try to make commentary about the things I'm seeing. Uh, you know, a lot of us are busy. We don't, for a while I thought, um, I don't have time to think about unique content for Twitter. You know, I'm, I'm putting that out there in, you know, in my class or on our website with new articles. But um, so these are just like almost casual observations. You know, I was at the Empire State Building the day before the election and put up a post about them boarding up. Um, so things I'm seeing and then uh, are most of the things that I'm, I'm posting. Do you, what, what happens in your brain where you're like, I should tweet this? Do you know, do you know what that is? Yeah, I think it's this space between, uh, it's not enough for an article on my website. It's not like a, a big extended thing I'm going to explore, but um, it's kind of worth an observation. Uh, so yeah, I didn't want to do, for example, an article about the storefronts closing because I actually didn't agree with that for the election because um, I felt like it, it sent the message that the city was dangerous when it wasn't necessarily. Um, but I thought it was an interesting thing to like post as an observation that said, I'm here, I'm out here in Midtown and this is, this is what I'm seeing. Um, and I'll think of some other examples, but. Um, yeah, I think that's a great, not enough for an article or for, you know, something you would do research on, but something yeah. worth remarking on. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and then we have, ah, Dr. Lynch. Um, I think that something that's really great about Dr. Lunch's feed is um, you clearly have a, a really firm grasp on your community and communicating within your community. And I think you have like 1,500 to 2,000 followers now, which is a lot, I think. Granted, when you look through them, they're like all like these people who are really active and important in the field that you're in and also would be interested in the stuff that you're doing and who you are as a person. Um, so again, I think I want to go back to that first question for you too, is like, how did you grow on Twitter to like become more comfortable sharing more about your work and yourself and, and other people's work? And I guess, where do you feel like you are now? I think I come from a slightly different angle. So before I started Twitter, and I'm not on Facebook, to be very honest, because I don't like, you know, to have friends which should not be my friends. Um, for instance, many patients um, where you should have a clear cut. So I thought about Twitter. Um, how do I want to appear, you know? And for me, Twitter is a very professional account. And that's why you can see, I make clear that I have my affiliation with Columbia. You can see my picture is very boring. You know, it's a doctor in a white coat in a laboratory. My background are plasma cells. So I wanted to make sure that people understand, you know, what is that Twitter account about? And um, I use it mainly and the inspiration came, I treat a very rare patient population, AL amyloidosis patients. 
those are 3,000 patients. So no industry is focusing with clinical trials on this patient population. They don't have a lot of support because there is no money making with this small, I would say, patient population. And there was such a lack of information for the patients so that I primarily wanted to reach out to a certain group of patients. And I started to tweet about the first human clinical trial we did here at Columbia. And then I realized that people are really keen on getting information firsthand from a doctor filtered, what I think is important. And I expanded that a little bit to my, or I expanded that to multiple myeloma, but I really try to stay away from my personal opinions. You will see that sometimes I could think, oh, yes, you have to treat that. It's, it's rarely. So I just treated CNN, you know, new president elect, or maybe as the war came down 30 years ago, you know, really highlights. But I, 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 I try to kind of, you know, not give it a too personal touch because I think, um, and maybe that is different from the prior, I would say, um, um, kind of, you know, speakers, that uh, why do people follow me? Mainly patients, colleagues, they want to know, okay, what's going on? Is there a meeting? What are the highlights? And I try to serve them via Twitter. Um, and what I realized, the most followers, I get, I get a big jump in followers when I have those tutorials, you know, when I say, okay, I just came back from the ASH meeting, here are my 10 highlights, or those abstracts are most important, you know, this is when you can see, you know, the numbers go really up. I'm not so sure whether, I mean, patients would love to see my family, but I'm not sure if my colleague is really interested in oh, guys, you know, I just run kind of in a marathon, you know, great. I mean, I see those tweets and I say, oh, my goodness, you know, do we really have to do that? So I don't know, but that's my personal opinion. Maybe it's a bit stiff, um, but um, I kind of, you know, see that more really professionally giving information and making sure that my colleagues and especially my patients are up to date. For personal opinions and pictures, I use Instagram, where I can control much more who is following me. I want to just um, mirror you back that that is a totally valid point of view. And I think that what I love about these panelists and I think what is what is great is that there's, again, you have to find the the way of using these platforms that feels most natural to you. I think that there is no like line uh, that you can cross. It's like, oh, that's for for a doctor or for a you know historian that's wrong for everyone in every situation i think you have to find like what that line is what feels right for you in the same way that if you were at a party like what type of person are you going to be are you going to be like listening are you going to be like pouring the drinks are you going to be you know hosting? Are you going to be the one in the middle of the center of attention telling everyone these great stories? Like there's always going to be a niche that fits who you are as a person. Um, and I think one of my favorite exercises to do with people who are like starting out is to think through like, what is it about me that first of all, that I like about me or that I think that people like about being around me or that I bring to whether that's my students, my colleagues, my friends, um, and how can I showcase that best on social media? And I think Dr. Lynch, you're absolutely right. There are other platforms that are like primed for other types of content, like that's more personal or ephemeral, meaning it like doesn't live forever on Twitter. Um, it passes like on, on um, Instagram stories. I mean, sorry to interrupt you because you have to be careful, you know, I mean, as a physician, you know, I have yeah. to treat all my patients the same, regardless whether they're Democrats or Republican. And with, I would say, inappropriate statements, you could hurt the feelings of somebody, you know, and the patient says, oh, my goodness. So I, I, I think what is most important is that you're, you're a public, if, if you go out, you can be criticized, you are public, and you have to wear about that, of that responsibility um, and the image you create. So that's why, I mean, if you really want to discuss, you know, or the personal opinions, I think in a certain profession, like a physician, then you have, you have to create an independent personal account. But, but here I kind of, you know, appear as a professional. So, so that's why I make that separation. I think yeah. if you come from a more, if, you, if you're a teacher, you know, in history, you know, you, you're always driven by your opinions and it's much more, I would say, appropriate to really share your opinion. So I think that your background is really important. I think, I think you're hitting on something and I absolutely want to open it up to other people. I think you're hitting on something that's important for people who are tuning in, which is, um, and I said this before people came in, 
like think about who the worst person if i'm gonna t i'm gonna tweet this thing i'm thinking about it it's been on my mind but you know if x person saw this that would make me feel really bad uh and it would make them feel bad and it might jeopardize you know how people view me or and and not just that but like how we would interact in a professional setting um sounds like dr lunch you think through like who are those what's that worst case example and draw back from from things that might uh, cross that line based on on that judgment. I think everyone has to make that judgment. Um, and I'd actually like to hear more because I really do think this is the crux of it for for all of us is like these gray areas and how to find the right space. Um, Seamus and Michelle, if you want to talk a little bit too about how this works for you when you're thinking about, um, you know, when it comes to opinions or politics or just personal stuff that may feel like an overshare. Like, how do you calibrate that? Uh, are there things that you draw back from posting about because of your profession or because you, you know, you worried about repercussions? I don't know, Michelle, if you want to go or should. Yeah, sure. I could, I just scrolled through my recent tweets to find some examples. And um, I think one thing I did when, when I was voting, so it wasn't really a call out to tell people to vote or not to vote or what to vote for, but I showed that I was at on the line. I had a picture of being on the line. I made a commentary about the replica Statue of Liberty that's behind the Brooklyn Museum um, that's in my book. So I kind of tied it to um, things that are relevant to what I do. Uh, and of course the underlying message is, I'm out here voting, please go vote as well. Um, but then I had a looking back, um, I think a day before I tweeted a, a photo I took of an FDNY truck that had a Red Lives Matter flag. And this was more just like, I didn't know that there was a Red Lives Matter flag. I know the Blue Lives Matter flag. Um, I was pretty sure I've seen news reports on Long Island that uh, fire departments are not supposed to have this flag. So I tweeted it from like a, I don't know, general knowledge standpoint for, for people to know. I tagged FDNY, but then also curiosity. And there were a couple comments, not my most popular tweet, um, and definitely some political underlings to it, but I, I didn't make a commentary about the flag. I just wrote, um, didn't know FDNY had its own Red Lives Matter flag, dot, dot, dot. You know, so it, it doesn't, in that way, it could be taken as controversial, but um, it's not overtly so. And I'm pretty, very open and political on, on Twitter. Um, and, you know, I think, um, it really has to do with like what you're comfortable with and um, that you are going to get responses. And so um, if those really bother you, you should not do it anymore. And if they don't bother you, like it doesn't matter. I mean, I, you know, I used to be a columnist for time and um, I got death threats and people sending me bullets in the mail. And so, you know, you kind of get a little bit more in order to like, people coming at you over stuff. And if it, if it you know, it, it at times it sort of frustrates me and I use the mute function. Um, but I think like, to me, it's, I don't, I don't think that there's, the way that I do Twitter is not the way I would recommend other people doing Twitter unless they were like me. And, and that that was something that they wanted out of it. And so this is why, you know, to kind of reiterate, it's like, if you want to use Twitter to advance your work, you have to find a way to connect with the community of people who would be reading your work anyway, to interact with them in positive ways, to contribute to what they're doing by retweeting what they're doing, and then to periodically make them aware of your work. And you know, there are times that are better to do that than others. Like I generally don't tweet about my work on weekends because nobody pays attention to work on weekends. I do it on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday afternoons. Like that is the best time to tweet about something that you want a bunch of attention to. And I'm pretty deliberate about that. Um, but I also have a much broader kind of set of audiences that I interact with on Twitter and I do it all in one space. And some people think it's hugely unprofessional and I don't really care because I'm fine doing it that way. Like it doesn't, really bother me. And the worst part about it for me is that like my dad follows me on Twitter and periodically prints out my tweets and shows them to my mom. 
And then they're like, why did you tweet that? And I'm like, don't follow me if it bothers you, right? Like, and, and like, that's that. And, and everybody else who kind of hates on me, I'm like, that's fine. It's just okay. It's just what life is. And if it's going to bother you a lot, don't do it and have a super professional Twitter. And if it's not going to bother you, like, that's fine. Do it the other way. But I would be kind of, you know, I just, I would think less about like, you know, the, the first question I would ask is like, who are you and what do you want in the world? And then to sort of back your way into Twitter with that. And then to make sure that you interact with people. Like you don't, you don't just, you know, the people who are the worst at Twitter are people who only post about themselves. Um, and so, you know, that is what I would highly caution you against. And as you acquire status um, to make sure that you use that in a way that helps lift up other people rather than like beat them down um, or just continue to advance your own interests. Maybe this is a good point just to talk about how to engage people on Twitter. Yeah, I was, that's a great idea. Like, let's talk about, um, especially when you find the people that you want to be in community with on Twitter, like what, what to, what to do? How do you, how do you lift them up? Like, what's an example of how you would. Yeah. I mean, I think or acknowledge like, someone. with Twitter, you can be very active and you can be more passive. Um, and I think some of the minimum ways you can do it is by like hearting, liking, someone's tweet, you can retweet it. Um, and I agree with Seamus about just, don't just be putting out your own work. Uh, that gets really boring. I can get that on, I don't know, I guess LinkedIn right? <laughs> or, or something else. Um, so mixing it up and then you can reply to people, uh, replies don't show up on your profile unless they click that tab that says tweets and reply. So don't worry about like cluttering up your profile with what you're saying to other people, but um, you know, let, letting them know your you have thoughts about what they've said or um, or support that, etc. Um, and then one note just about you know the fear of what you want to post on Twitter. I would say that it's often surprising what people get worked up about, and you can't really fully anticipate that. And as an example, uh, someone got really worked up about my use of the word adorable about two weeks ago, <laughs> and I used it for this very adorable lighthouse that I went to visit <laughs> on Hudson River, and he said. Um, you're not using the word adorable correctly. And then we got, I got into a conversation about this is the actual definition and the Latin root. So I think I won, but it's sort of like, you know, no one has commented really about my political or mildly political comments, but they were very upset about this lighthouse. So like shrug, you know, I couldn't have predicted that at all. Yeah, there's, there's sort of a saying, it's like no one wins when you get into an argument on Twitter in the end, because like you're, you've gotten into an argument and you probably have, uh, like sort of more stressful day after that and then also sure. like in the end no one no one wins um <laughs> Dr. Lynch have you had something that you've posted that you had at least like a dissenting opinion or people come in with like I, I especially in your field I think like there there is just like healthy debate about different types of ways to approach um even the most professional things yeah. um yeah, I mean, as I mentioned already, usually I use Twitter to um, distribute information. Um, I found uh, Twitter, especially during COVID, very extremely helpful, I have to say. So I, I could spread the word to my patients, you know, make sure wear a mask or um, kind of, you know, we have something new here or this is the kind of, you know, rate of complication. So it, it made me feeling good to to reach a lot, I would say, kind of an amount of my patients or many patients, even colleagues, you know, as we had the uh, COVID pandemic here in March, you know, to, to send a tweet with me in a mask and send it to my colleagues and say, hey, be careful, you know, it's coming, you know, this is not just kind of, you know, a joke, this is really, really dangerous. So I think that was very kind of, you know, I felt good about that, to have that tool with Twitter. Coming back to negative kind of, you know, comments, um, you will be surprised. You can see how careful I think about tweets and, and, and I really kind of, you know, put a lot of effort in that. But even in moments where I would not expect, I got comments from colleagues and say, this is nonsense and what are you thinking about? So very often, you know, sometimes you get upset and you say, you know, I spent so much work on creating that tutorial and I really try to give a message and 
Why do they kind of, you know, give you just negative comments? So I think sometimes you have to say, okay, I'm just move on, you know, and usually I do not try to get into an argument uh, with this, if it is not, if it is without substance, you know, I mean, there are some arguments, you can really have a scientific discussion, you can, uh, but if it is kind of, you know, I would say um, something that I think is more personal using kind of, you know, then I just try to ignore it, you know, and not get into any kind of, you know, fight over this. It, you, you kind of, you know, just lose too much energy. Yeah, I, I think this speaks to different different modalities of responding to to Twitter. Like, is it worth it or not? And these discussions that we have about about uh, like who do I care about, right? Whose opinions matter to me? And I, I do that as Columbia's steward for for uh, our social media as well. Uh, the people that matter to us are the people who are in our community. We have a lot of haters, <laughs> as one could imagine, for many reasons, basically any reason, every reason we have haters. And if they're within our community, I, I take that very seriously and we take special care around those. Um, if, if they're just, if they're random people from anywhere, um, that's not something we engage with and, uh, you know, we treat it that way. Um, I do want to uh, segue to talk a little bit about, and then want to make sure if anyone has any other questions, just please put it in the chat at this time. Um, Twitter can be a, a challenging place um, based on who you are using Twitter, I think too, because of, uh, because of the polarization of, of social media and America. Um, I, I think I align more actually, maybe even further to one side <laughs> with, with use cases to Seamus. Um, I'm fairly fearless on Twitter. I'm mostly not my professional self and my, my outside self, my personal self. Um, but again, you can draw a lot of negative attention when it comes to raising things that are outside of what people expect from you. Um, and it's a lot about expectations, right? I, and Seamus, did you want to speak to this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think like it didn't shock me when Michelle was like, this guy told me I was using the word adorable wrong. Cause I was like, you know, there's like, you know for the guys out there, like, don't be that guy who's the like, well, actually guy, you know, the person who responds to everything being like, well, actually, you know, like, um, and I do have to say, I think that, um, you know, it part of the terrain of Twitter is like um, a lot of racialized and um, gendered, uh, for lack of a better phrase, like violence. Um, and, uh, you know, when I write about stuff um, that's part of my queer community, like I get DMs, I get all kinds of really negative things um, um, in response. And so, you know, it is like the comment section of the internet at times where aspects of people's, um, the worst aspects of people's personality, uh, but also the anonymity allows people to engage in all kinds of attacks. Like, you know, I've had tweets of mine reported to the university um, uh, um, uh, for things that I'm like doing that are inappropriate, not even things that I'm saying, which aren't inappropriate. It's just that like, I happen to be queer and people don't like that. And, you know, you know the idea that the chair of a department, you know, would, would engage with a queer community in the way that I do, gets raised. And so I would say that like, um, I don't want to make people fearful, but I do think that there is a degree of harassment um, that you will likely experience if you're not like cisgendered, you know, straight white dude. And if you are, you're going to experience some of it, but probably a lot less. And so I think it's, it's an important thing to kind of be aware of because, you know, the trolls definitely come for you. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the, the mute function is your friend, um, as is the report and block function. Um, and that's something that I use from time to time because I'm like, you know, I'm having a decent day and suddenly there's like this vitriol in my feed. As much as it doesn't bother me, it bothers me. Right. It doesn't change how you feel about yourself as a person because, you know, hopefully most of us have a secure sense of self, but it also isn't pleasant to deal with. Um, I want to also uh, shout out another function, which is delete. I think um, 
something I've, I've tended towards more in recent years, I think, is if I think something and I'm like, I, I actually do this almost every time I tweet now. It's If I want to tweet something, I will write it out and I will screenshot it and I will send it to a friend of mine just to be like, is that enough? Because I think sometimes we're like, oh, I just gotta say this or put this out there. or I just wanna respond. Um, and sometimes a lot of the things that you have on your mind that you're thinking about, if you just have a conversation with someone you know, maybe that'll, that'll suffice. Um, and I'm talking again when it comes to more, again, more of the conversations that are more political in nature and, and sit on that line that you're not sure if this is like a part of your, your public persona. I do also wanna harken back to something that Dr. Lynch said about like, uh, you know, different platforms for different uses, different platforms for different gateways because some of them you can have different followers, be more private, have more of your family, your children. Um, I, I, I totally respect that and I do it myself. I do also wanna say though that there is, again, no private social media. There's no world in which what you put out there on social media is guaranteed to be private forever all the time. And I think that's just something to go in clear eyed about um, and not be afraid because of it, but be judicious about it. Um, that like, don't be like one of these politicians that doesn't know that uh, they're, the things they like can be seen by other people when they go into the feed or like they have a private Twitter that they're doing, they're saying all their worst opinions on. And then of course, if someone screenshots out and finds it. I think like, who are you when people walk down college walk or walk down the halls at UIMC, who is the person that people encounter there? That's the person or who you, who are you when you go to a conference or who are you when you're like after class and you're chatting with your, your students? That's the person you wanna be on the internet and as well. You just wanna find a way to present that person um, in the way that makes you most comfortable. And there is again, no wrong way to do that. Um, Gosh, yeah, I really, I really love that description because if I think about the difference between like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, uh, Instagram totally visual. Don't really feel like you can put like deep thoughts on there on occasion, maybe. Facebook, we all know what it's about. It was, and um, you know, it's really more of your personal circle, uh, etc. But and you can't post too much on Facebook, otherwise you're accused of like clogging someone's feed up, <laughs> right? Uh, but then Twitter is a great way to post these thoughts that show who you are. For me, it's like the passing things I see or the things that I think about um, that do show a bit more about you than, than a perfectly curated Instagram account or also a perfectly curated Facebook account. So I think that description is very apt. And I think there, there are times, right, where you are hyper, hyper cautious, right? And I think that something we talked about before everyone got let in was, are you tenured or not? Um, I think this is, if I were up for a new job, how would that color what I, what I think of my social media presence that's visible to the outside world? And it's totally fine and normal if that, that gauge changes throughout time. And you're like, now is a time where I feel like I wanna be more private. Now is a time where I feel like I can be you know, more free. Um, that's just a reality of the world that we live in. Um, and understandably someone, you know, very secure in their role, someone with tenure, um, someone who doesn't see patients, someone who, you know, versus has patients, um, you're going to make different calculuses with that. So I think even just writing down, sitting down with a pen and paper and, and who am I and how is that, how is Twitter going to solve this? I know that that seems like such an old school way to go about social media, but I think that that setting intentions and expectations for yourself and other people is my favorite thing. Uh, and, and it works for, for all purposes. Um, so we only have about three minutes to close out. And I'd really like to hear a little bit about like, when you know to, like, how do you balance Twitter? Because it can be super engaging, even just to like, read it, right? Like, you're just there for suddenly you've been there for an hour and you've been scrolling for an hour and you don't know how you got to where you are. So how do you, especially in this time where we're spending so much time on our screens, you know, how do you take a break from and make space for yourself off offline? 
maybe I should start. <laughs> um, <laughs> Everyone else is like, I uh, don't know. Yeah, no, I mean, it, 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 I mean, if if you if your Twitter is kind of in a very politically engaged and you want to use it as a platform to express your personal opinion, you will kind of, you know, soaked into kind of, you know, to Twitter, you know, at the time of election. If you are using that platform to kind of, you know, report facts, you know, then I will have tons of tweets, you know, around meetings like American Society of Hematology or uh, American Society of Clinical Oncology meetings, you know. Um, so it, it comes in waves, you know, and sometimes during the summertime, you know, I also don't want to tweet too much, you know, people should not be resistant and say, oh, she again, because I have some colleagues, you know, when I see the tweet, I said, oh, great, you know, your colleague, now he's on a horse, great, you know, that's what I need, you know, Sunday morning to see my nice colleague, you know, riding a horse. I mean, they're really, you should be really conscientious, you know, and I completely agree, you should never tweet too much about yourself. You should make sure that you present yourself, your group, you know, your research, whatever you want to say. Um, so I, I would I don't have any rules that I say I have to tweet kind of you know those days. Usually I tweet weekly, but usually it kind of you know is related to you know here are my highlights from that meeting, or we have a new trial open, or we have fantastic results, or yesterday or I tweeted right away, you know Pfizer and uh, BioNTech has great kind of you know results. My patients, I know, they follow me and they sit there and they say, oh, great, you know, we need that. That's also positive news. Um, just one comment, you know, you mentioned this, this tenure. If, if you are pro tenure and you have to think about that you tweet something that might jeopardize your future career, don't tweet it. You know, I, I, I truly think, you know, the social media uh, uh, also deserves some respect and we should think about what we tweet and if we feel that is, Kind of you know something that would prevent us in our future career i think we should not do it period but that's my personal comment yeah i don't i don't know that i fully agree with that i mean i think you should just be aware you can't always predict how people are going to respond to things and you know if you Dennis, this is a free country we have yeah, ex exactly and i would say like i have some my boss but is an I... asshole i mean yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah I you, that's you, just human decent behavior, you know, and, and respect, treat everybody respectful. Also people who follow you on Twitter, regardless who they are and what kind of, you know, where they're coming from and what they think. I mean, that at least kind of, you know, this is how I treat my neighbor. I treat people on Twitter, even if I don't see them. Oh yeah, I mean, I think with pleasantness, I just think that there are things that people make judgments about that, you know, could affect you that can have negative impacts. and that's often their problem. And, you know, I'm not sure, like I can see people being like, I should only talk about myself as a worker all the time. Like, what if I talk about myself as a mom and the work that I have to do as a mom? And people are like, well, isn't she always complaining about being a mom or, you know, um, shouldn't she be, you know, shouldn't this person be doing their work rather than on vacation, dot, dot, dot. I can see this endless regress of this. And I, you know, I, I so I, 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 I understand it, but I think like, there are lots of things that could impact us that we um, may do anyway. And um, because sometimes it's when those like people are making judgments that I would view as illegitimate judgments that nonetheless affect your career. Um, I would say the things that I do is like, I delete um, the Twitter app from my phone pretty regularly and then reinstall it. So like, if I know that I'm gonna like try and like have a weekend where I'm just not engaging with the world, I do not have the self-discipline to not check Twitter on my phone. And so I just delete the app. It's like really easy to do. And then like on Sunday, I can reinstall it. Like it takes 30 seconds. And so I would think about, you know, I'd kind of do stuff like that. And then I have like definite no social media times. Like I don't, I write in the mornings. And so just, just as I'm not on my, like I'm not on my phone, I don't have my email open, I don't have Twitter anywhere near me. And so I think also having spaces in my life where I don't do it, that that works for me. Could I add just one thing? Um, I, I, I tweet about maybe once a day, maybe a little more, but I think to keep the momentum up one a day, at least in the field I am, is like a good pace. I do it in the morning because a lot of journalists are operating in the morning. I guess professors are working in the morning often. So maybe afternoon makes sense for Seamus. Um, and I think we've talked a lot about the potential negative outcomes you might have on Twitter, but I would say that uh, people are very excited when you respond to them. Um, you know, they might know you as a person that wrote that paper or spoke at that conference. 
and they're not, if they tag you, they may, they're probably expecting that you won't reply. So when you do, um, it's super exciting. Um, and then you can build up that relationship in a, you can reach people in a new way that, that didn't exist before Twitter existed. It's less serious than an email. Um, so I think that's some of the, the positive things. And someone asked how to spot trolls. You can look at their tweets and see if they're just constantly, constantly harassing people about the same subject. Um, so some ro some bots do that, some real people do that. Um, and I've had some, someone wished uh, COVID on me once when I tweeted a picture from France about COVID testing uh, and that I was there this summer with my husband. So have fun having COVID. Oh, nice, how nice. <laughs> that's uh, such a great place is Twitter. Yeah, that, I mean, <laughs> and she was a real person, so. Um, um, I am so grateful to all of you and I feel like uh, I'm going to hand it to Adina momentarily. Uh, I just said in the chat, like a wise person once said each day there on Twitter, there's one main character and the goal is never to be that person. Um, that's my mantra. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think with, with our panelists here, sort of like choose your fighter, maybe it's like who, who do you feel like of the of the view? These are three people who use this platform for in different ways that fit themselves. And you know, I think I hope all of you have like thought a little bit more about um, who you are vis-a-vis uh, -vis that. Um, I'm trying to get the slides back now for Adina, but Adina, are you there? Okay, so we can, we can do it. Yeah, Sorry. Ben can do it. We're good. Yeah. Do it. Awesome, thank you so much. I'd love to just join Acacia in thanking our panelists and also thanking Acacia for her their amazing facilitation of a, a really great panel. So uh, thank you all very, very much. Um, ah, what just happened here? There we go. So if there are any questions that were not answered, please do contact us and we will pass them along and, and try to get an answer. We encourage you to join us um, on the faculty Slack workspace to continue this conversation. Um, we will be sending a survey um, to see how you what you liked about it and also be sharing the recording. So if you came in late or wanna share it with a friend that will be available to you. Uh, we encourage you to share with us your Twitter success stories because maybe next year you could be on this panel. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, if you aren't already, and that would be a shame, please um, follow us at Columbia Faculty on Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, and join uh, our faculty Slack channel. And we look forward to um, connecting with you in all of these different ways. And as Akisha says, there's so much more to say about Twitter and they are a reference and a, and, a, and a source and just a great ally to have. So thank you all so much. It's one o'clock and we try to respect everyone's time. Have a great afternoon, enjoy some sunshine and we'll see you soon. Thank you. <laughs>